Inside of NTFS, there is a master file table, and inside the master file table, there's file records and folder records. Those are basically what we're looking at for files and indexes. And then there's something called an allocation bitmap. That's what tells us if a sector is allocated or not allocated. It's actually clusters. The whole cluster is allocated or unallocated. So when a, you have a hard drive that's 500 gigs, but you only use 35 megs of it, let's not copy all 500 gigs. Well, let's just copy to 35 megs. That makes sense to everybody? Yes? No? Okay, so that's what I'm going to select. Now you'll watch what happens. It's going to load the tables. So it's a very small amount of data. So like on this 100 gig hard drive, maybe it's uh, you know 30 meg, it can be up to 300 meg. Like it's a very small amount that I'm trying to copy that will build a tree. That is all you need to build a tree. All that stuff, all of those other programs are doing where they're crawling through a whole hard drive and they're carving and doing all kinds of stuff to give you a tree is unnecessary. If it's an active directory, if it's an existing directory, then you already have what you need in your file system to tell you that. All you need is to find those records. Everybody understand what I'm talking about? And I'll doc I have all this documented. It's coming up in the NTFS stuff. But here, all I'm going to do is hit enter. And now it's going to go and copy the MFT table. And you're going to see it do... Uh, file records. So you'll see file, 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 then you'll see some index records. So each one of those files is all the files that it needs to actually do files, folders, directory structure, dates, times, content, all of that stuff's there. It did not copy a single file. No other files from the drive were copied, right? You understand? There's no data that was covered. It's already done. It's already finished what I asked it to do. And it tells me right here so it did the files, then it did a bitmap. So it went to the middle of the drive and got the flags for the bitmap, which will be, you know, you'll see a bunch of Fs usually in a row for allocated and unallocated. And then, so I got a bitmap, and then it tells you allocated clusters for this drive is 74 gigs. So I have a 100 gig drive. I got 25% of my drive is not used by the active file system. So it makes sense to everybody. So now, when I do that, it'll switch all the pictures to checkboxes. So anything that's allocated versus unallocated, there'll be a checkbox for. I can take this one step further. The tree, the content that's there, I can actually build a physical tree for in the Windows software. So I could unplug this, go to the Windows software, and I could say, here's the My Documents folder, bam, and select that. So I'm going to show you real quick how that works and I can select it for imaging. I can actually say I don't want to image anything else but this document folder. But in order to do it, since I don't have the network module set up, I am going to disconnect it from the drive and plug it in. But remember I told you if I was on Windows and I wanted to see that configuration file, this map table, remember if I have an HPA at the size of the drive, I cannot access it. So I'm just going to make sure I don't have an HPA at this point. So I'm going to I'm going to reset the HPA back to its maximum. Okay. So that's its native value. It set it back on the 320 gig drive. Everybody clear what I did? Okay. Now the other thing is too, if I plug this into Windows right now and I don't have anything but a file system and Windows starts crawling through it, what's it going to do? It might crash. It doesn't have files to look at. It has nothing to see. So that's the only other reason that I do this is I go here, I go all the way down to deactivate MBR. And I turn off the MBR so Windows won't see it. That way I don't cause it to crash because I need to use my DeepSpar tool. Everybody happy so far? And this is where things go wrong because I don't know if I have the same version on my laptop. The version of the software for DeepSpar is the, has to match the same version of what your file system uses on the card. And I travel with all these cards and a couple of them have a different version. <laughs> so I'm hoping for the best on the version numbers. So just to show you, I almost always start up disk management so I know what I'm looking at because I don't like to be blindsided. So I should have a 300 gig. Uh, so I got 300 gig and I have no initialization because it's 55 BB. 
Everybody good? All right, now I'm going to go to my deep spar tool, which I hope is here, and I hope it works. Now, the deep spar tool is not very fancy. Uh, it is uh, kind of like a half-written project file. And so I'm looking at the hard drive that exists. So if I had network, they would have names here. But I have local hard drives, so these are the local hard drives. If I had the project ID that I had told you guys I'd typed in, they would keep showing up in the list on the network module. So I'm going to select this. Uh, I do have to create this stupid project. So I'm going to call this ATL class May 18. So all that does is make a directory on my hard drive. See it? C, data recovery, blah, 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 recovered. I'm going to select the hard drive. Sorry, yeah, I have to put that directly on your laptop or understand the device you're looking from. You cannot point that to a server, for instance. Not on mine. Well, uh, you can do, uh, so it tries to make it local. There is a way to do it with UNC. You can do UNC coding, which is double slashes at the beginning. So there's a way to do that, but um, but you're right. It's it's a lot easier just to do it locally and do whatever. So this is where I have a problem. I did. I have one that the executable that I have is the wrong version of the thing that I'm looking at, and uh, and I can fix it later if I need to. I'll fix it later. But what would happen here is it would just show me the MFT tree, and you would see it here and I could just click on it. And so like I said, I'll fix it or I'll have to load another executable, but you have to unload the executable, load the executable, and I have to stay at the same versions all the time. This is the only real painful thing is all the DeepSpar stuff. Every time there's an update, you've got to go update everything. You've got to go all the way across your board and do every single thing and keep updating them. And then it makes this folder and then it makes this directory structure. You have to parse the directory structure. But here's the important thing I need to make sure if you're using the Windows tool and you're doing this, is when you build this little tree, you do not currently have data. You are only looking at the tree. If you select something, it still has to go image the something and come back with your answer for you to get that data. Okay? Once that happens, you do not have to use this tool at all. You can use any other tool that you want. So I'm going to show you what it looks like since I don't have to worry about versions. So the exact same thing would happen. Here's my drive. The only thing I have on here is my MFT. This is what the deep spar would look at if I told it to. Open drive files. It's, there's no data on this drive. All this is processing right now is just the MFT structure I told it to do. Do you guys understand what I'm saying? So when this is done, you will see there's no files. There's nothing for it to point to, but I still have my tree. This is the tree from that drive. This is what the deep spar would show me. Yeah. And that's because you haven't made the image yet? Correct. You've only just grabbed the MFT info from the source. Absolutely. 100%. That's all that's happened. All I did was MFT and bitmap. There's nothing else. So the only reason I would do this on the deep spar is so that I could say, and it'll look just like this so that I don't have to go through the pain of opening the trying to figure out how to solve the configuration file problem. But, so if I want this folder on a deep spar, this tree would show up on that left-hand side, and all you have to do is check, oh, I want this, and I want this folder, and then there'll be a right click, and it'll say, image these files. So then it'll go off, image the files, and come back, and then you can extract them, dump them to your laptop. Uh. This info is on your sort uh, on your destination drive, right? The uh, so the, right now you transfer just the MFT and the bitmap stuff from the source to the destination drive. Correct. You plug the destination drive into the Windows computer to run the software right. to get the tree. Yes. And then now, when you make these check marks, that's going to go back to the check marks are being made on the destination drive, so that when you hook the destination drive back up to the Atola, it will know which ones you're looking to image. Up to the deep spark, yes. Okay. You're exactly right. Uh, if you have the network module, then you can skip one step. When you right click and you say image, it'll actually do it now. It'll actually go off and image those. 
like I have to now disconnect the drive, put it back on the deep spar, so I can do this without paying $350, basically, or setting up a bunch of networks. Like I already have 16 cases of hard so, so hardware. So spar knows when you check whatever you're going Correct. to Correct. There is a map. Knows to go back to the destination drive and figure out which files you're looking yeah, at. Yeah, it'll have, a, there'll be one menu option, it'll say image selected files, and you select that, it crawls through, and you'll see like a little log file over here going, selecting, 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 and you'll see it'll actually tell you all the file names you're selecting. And then when you're done with the selecting, then all you do, I'm gonna do exactly the same thing, but I'm only gonna image the 74 gigs. I'm just gonna image the 74 instead of one file. Does that make sense? So that's all you would do, you select those, it looks exactly like this part. And as a matter of fact, the DeepSpar can talk to our Studios Technician version. There's an R Studios Technician version that's like $800, and it has a DeepSpar module, and you can work straight from R Studios on the DeepSpar. You don't even have to use DeepSpar's tool to do it. So, so now I'm done with that. Now I'm gonna take my drive again. I'm gonna unplug it. I'm gonna go back to the DeepSpar. So, but the power of what I just showed you is that I only need the MFT to get my tree. I don't need it to touch everything else on the drive. I only need that, and we're gonna use that power here as we're going through stuff. There are certain tools that can do that. I showed you how our studio, I just did that. Most people don't realize our studios even does that because they're usually going through the scan process and they hit scan and then it goes through the whole thing and builds a whole tree and takes three days. Well, when you're doing a raid array, that's when the rubber hits the road. You wanna be as fast as possible. So you don't wanna do all that. You don't wanna wait three days to find out if you were right or you were wrong. Why don't you just do what I did in 10 seconds? Find out if you're right or you're wrong or do it another way, do it with graphics or do something else. So there's ways to do this and that's what I'm talking about now is speed. So, so I'm looking at data at this point. So if you hand me a hard drive and it comes into my lab and I find out immediately, copy a couple sectors, I find out immediately it's NTFS, I have an option. Oh no, it might be my drive has died. Be healed. All right, ta-da, that works. <laughs> so now any changes that you would have made to that map, that would be there and those check boxes would tell you that. So then I hit F5 and then I go execute from zero and copy. And now there's this box, it's called image selected area only. So if I had checked the folder, it would say this would be on image selected area only. And uh, we're pretending I've selected all the folders, and but not unallocated space. I'm not going to touch unallocated space. I've got 74 gigs. It's going to copy. Okay. So and I'm going to let it run. I'm going to do this. You don't have to go back and change the the, uh, the HPA again. No. Uh, so remember when I've said before I only do the HPA at the very end of my imaging process. So, so technically, I'm not at the end of my imaging process, right? I would have only done that after I've already done all this other work that I would have done. Then I would finally go, I've got a perfect copy of everything I want. Then I would set the HPA. Then I would do my recovery or make an image of the partition. Because that's the other thing. If I do an HPA, instead of making an image of a 300 gig drive, I'd make it an image of a 100 gig drive. And that way, if I have an in-case uh, folder or something like that, I have to, I'm have to. i going to do an in-case job and, and make an in-case image. I don't also get the deep spars binary data in there because that's a real giveaway to a lot of uh, officers who know. Uh, so if I send that off to Canada and they know about a deep spar, they're going to go look at those last couple of sectors and go, you have data on here that didn't belong to the client. Right? There you go. But if I, if I had said an HPA, it won't be there. There won't be any other indication except for um, the deep spar, if you don't wipe it correctly, the sectors will say unprocessed sectors. They'll, they'll, it'll stamp them on uh, certain sectors on the drive. So, um, so anyway, so this is gonna take, uh, it won't take too long, 20 minutes or whatever. It says 12, but it's gonna just image 
the uh, the allocated area at this point. So what I have selected, then I can go back and extract pictures, data, content. But I'm actually doing something very surgical here. If somebody brings a drive into my office, if I have this option right away, that is the first option that I do. I cut time down right away. I go straight for allocated. Don't mess with unallocated unless it's a forensics case or something else like that. Or unless the client says, oh, well, there's some files I really wanted that aren't there. You know, uh, then I've got your clone. I've still got your clone. I've still got your copies. I can still go get unallocated space if I want to. Does that make sense? But, I, but like I said, 99% of the time, data recovery clients just want what was there. And they usually want, you know, they'll call me and go, we went on vacation last month, and I don't have these vacation pictures. I have all the other ones because I already uploaded those to Dropbox or whatever. But there's one folder that was, you know, honeymoon in Hawaii, and I don't have that. So they'll say things like that to me from, from that perspective. So, all right, so for a time constraint problem, I'm going to switch back, and we're going to come back to that when that's done. So we're going to use all this power, and I'm just giving you a demo of this. We're going to go running through stuff. Uh, this is the DeepSpar software. Like you can actually get like an overview. This is the older version of their software. You can get an overview of what's happened to your drive, what sectors are good. You can get an overview of sectors that these were copied ignoring ECC. This particular drive was pretty bad, but these were all JPEGs. So I'd recovered them with ignore ECC. And ignore ECC, even if it's off by a little bit, the JPEG algorithm, you won't even notice it. It might be a dot somewhere on in a picture, but you might not notice it at all. So I did do a uh, recovery on some pretty deep stuff from that standpoint, but that did take two months uh, to do that particular one with all those ignore ECCs. Something's better than nothing. All right, so let's start talking about the data. Some of this is gonna be redundant now, and I teach by redundancy so that people get the whole thing. Um, for primary partitions, you can have extended partitions. Almost today, almost always, extended partitions are only because Linux is here. Linux, people reinstall Linux on a Windows machine, then you'll have your Windows partition, then you'll have your Linux primary partition, you'll have a swap partition, and then you'll have an extended partition that has any others like your home directory or somebody else's home directory in them. That's almost always the only reason I even see them these days. It's super rare. It used to be fairly common, but it's been a decade or more. Everybody wants their hard drive the same size as their laptop or the same size as their blah, blah, blah. Um, and then GUID partition tables. Those were created to get around our two terabyte problem. It's two terabyte because we can only do 32 bits. When you get to GUID partition table, they're 64 bit. So we're at a 64 bit file system, operating system, Everything's now headed toward 64-bit from that perspective, okay? Which is also why AF, APFS, Max, their file systems still have stuff in HPF, A, HFS that's 32-bit. APFS is 64-bit. So they're moving that direction. Now, they've already had GUID partition tables since 2006. They were the first ones, actually, to do GUID partition tables on a commercial release. Um, so all Macs since 2006 have used the GUID partition table as their primary function and they make an MBR only because Windows exists because they wanted to be able to make boot camp and make Windows boot or they want to be able to have Linux boot on their machines and use their machines as a multi-purpose machine. So that's why the MBR exists there. They don't need it and they don't care about 55AA but all of our systems do so they added it. So that's why that's there. So, uh, in the olden days, we used to use cylinders, heads, and sectors, and LBA blocks are a calculation of cylinders, heads, and sectors, okay? So, we used to have to actually say, I have 17 heads, and I have 65 sectors in this ring, and I have a cylinder. Now, let me explain what a cylinder is. So, when we could have completely abandoned this when we went to LBA blocks. When we went to LBA in the mid-90s, we got rid of all this legacy stuff, but we didn't have the internet. We didn't have, I mean, we're talking internet basically 1993. That was when it was made public. It was previously existed. ARPANET's been around a lot longer, all the way back to 1960s. 1968, 1969, 
uh, same as Unix, same as C, same as AUK, same as all those tools, all the way back to 1969. Uh, and that's also where Unix time starts. It's January 1st of 1970. That's where Unix time is going to run out of time in 2038. So you know our year 2000 problem that we had with our PCs? They have the same problem happening in 2038. And they have a way larger base than we have. And it's going to be a catastrophe. Because we don't even know what they're running. We don't even know what's running it anymore. And they're still based on time that hasn't been fixed for epic time. It counts by seconds since 1970. So disaster is coming, just so you know. Uh, we got 20 years. That seems like a lot, but it's not a lot to fix the problems that are out there. So when your microwave doesn't run one day, Anyway, uh, so back to this problem. We had legacy stuff and we could have gotten rid of it, but we had no way using, you know, to tell everybody, don't use this. Don't use Norton Utilities anymore. Norton Utilities was one of the most popular products on a PC back in the late 80s, early 90s, because it would repair a lot of disk problems that you would have on the fly. But the problem is if you introduce a new technology, and you don't tell anybody and you can't stop them from running the tool, it will eat your new technology. Does that make sense? So that was the real reason that that exists. That was a real problem. So look at this structure. Now this is upside down. So I, this is my graphic. I made it. It's upside down. Really everything starts at the bottom. So here's the picture that I want you to see. A cylinder is a, it's just a virtual thing. It's not a real thing. It's a virtual thing. You have a track that goes around and in those tracks, every track that sits above the track on the other side and then sits above that track below that and that track below that, that's a cylinder. It's virtual. It's not a real thing. But we counted it that way when we were putting it in a PC so that we knew how many tracks, how many platters. So you would actually be able to calculate that with the mathematical formula. So this is a cylinder. Wherever it intersects and goes all the way through, if you take a glass cup and you sit it over your platters, everywhere it intersects all of your platters all the way down, that's your cylinder. Everybody understand so far? So here's the thing. Where's the fastest location on your drive? Outside, outside edge, right? So your outside edge. So as you move into your drive, so you're counting LBA 0, LBA 1, LBA 2, blah, blah, blah. Maximum LBA is close to the inside, right? So we don't have to know exactly where everything is because now it's all logical, so it's stacked in these and the drive handles everything. But when you say 50%, your head is about right here at 50%. It may not be exactly there, but and you don't know if it's reading which side of the platter. But partitions were made to start on what was called cylinder boundaries. So you're all the way back, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use that picture on the first page from 1982, 1984, this hard drive. Remember I told you to look at this hard drive and you think differently about it as you go through? So imagine that you are in 1982 and you are Microsoft stealing CPM from somebody and only paying him $5,000. But you're going to steal it from him and you're going to make an operating system that you're going to sell to IBM in 30 days. Which is all it took. 30 days. I'm not kidding. It was like July 17th and they sold it to IBM on August 17th. 30 days. So they bought somebody else's stuff, changed what they wanted to, slapped some Microsoft logos on it and send it out the door. So, look it up if you don't believe me. Uh, so, um, the guy, I don't know if you guys know, but uh, Bill Gates originally worked for Altair. Altair? Remember the Altair 8088 that was in, the, uh, was in or Altair 8000 or whatever it was that was in the popular mechanic before anybody was even popular with any computers or anything? That was the big deal that everybody bought and had these little switches and registers on it and you could build your own computer for the first time before Apple or any of these other things were really around. Um, so the guy that owned that company uh, lives in Georgia. He kind of got screwed over by Bill Gates. Bill Gates wrote BASIC for his platform. And uh, he's only like uh, an hour, hour and a half. Um, he became a, a doctor and lives in, um, in Georgia. But he got screwed over big time by Bill Gates. So he just went on and did something else. and got completely 
out of computers altogether. So, so anyway, so all the way back in these days when you're talking about this, uh, this drive, what's your problem with a drive like this? What's the main problem with a drive like this compared to today? What do you think it would be? If I plug this drive in today, what's the first thing that you're going to say? Besides, is it compatible? Uh, how fast is that drive? Slow, right? This is slow. Really slow. But you're in 1984 or 1982, and you're designing DOS. You don't need Windows. There's no Windows. There's no graphical operating systems. There's nothing for you to worry about. So you're only worried about the DOS prompt from this directory to this directory, and that's it, right? But still, if you move from one, one partition to another, and you were limited on your sizes of partitions, so everything was way smaller than it is today. So the problem is this. If you move through your drive, you have multiple platters. There's at least four in this whole thing. So we've got eight heads. Only one head can be on at a time. You're not moving all your heads and reading and writing all the way down through the whole stack all at once. You have to turn off a head, turn on a head, turn off a head, turn on a head. So you're designing an operating system and you have to say, hey, um, if I have to write a partition anywhere on this drive, if I can make a partition anywhere, then as I move through this drive, it's going to take me a lot longer. It's really slow. Does that make sense? So let's make a decision. Instead of turning off a head and turning on a head, why don't we just leave the one head on all the time? and we'll just go straight across the drive. So we never have to turn it off. All we have to do is go, are you a partition? Yes. Are you a partition? Yes. Are you a partition? Yes. And you just go all the way across one plateau. You don't have to search through all of the others. So you're making a decision that is a calculation because this was basically about eight megs or something in that range. Like you could actually go all the way through uh, Later on, after we started switching to LBAs, the entire stack ended up being a total of 8 megs, which is why we have a partition gap of 8 megs. Back then, it wasn't that much space, but they did a calculation, and so there's a number, and there's a specific number of locations that you could have a partition. It couldn't begin anywhere. You had to be specific about where it started. So FDisk, when it was written, there is an actual thing that says partitions can only start on cylinder boundaries. Understand? So it always had to be here. You could not end the partition and then start the partition. You had to end the partition and then begin it on the next cylinder boundary. You could not just start it anywhere in between that you wanted to start. It had to be on one side of one platter. All your partitions were on one side of one platter. And that made it quick. So if I go to D drive, you, 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 yep. Bam, I'm done. You only had to check like four times. You didn't have to check this whole stack. Everybody understand what I mean? So that's one of the biggest design decisions that they made about this whole process. And we lived with that. It was in FDisk. I, was, um, I started out as a developer and I was in the Microsoft Developers Group. I actually pulled the code for FDisk. Sure enough, it's actually in there all the way up until 2008. In 2008, you tried to make a partition. It had to be in a specific location. You could not make it anywhere you wanted. So, as we're going on, now you're moving, you're Microsoft and you're writing operating systems. You're moving forward and you're, uh, you have a hardware manufacturer. You have people making hard drives and things that wanted things to be different. We want it to be faster. We can't handle all this little stuff all the time. 512 bytes is really small. 512 bytes in 1982 was big. In 2008, it's not big. In 2016, it's not big. In 2018, it's not big. So we need more. We need something else. So here's the, here's the story. Um, and before I move on, another thing, another caveat of this picture. If your first partition is closest to the outer edge of your disk, because you're using from LBA0, right? You write your MBR, and now you're at sector 63, or you're at sector 2048 on Vista and later. So from here on, your outside edge is where you've written your first partition. So where's your second partition going to be? If you make a second partition, where is it? Way further in, right? So Because you're going to say, I want my first partition to be 100 gigs, but my last partition is going to be 32 gigs, right? So you're a Mac and you want to uh, put boot camp on your drive. 
So it does what partition magic used to do. What happens is it says, I'm going to defrag all the content from here, move it to here. I'm going to make an entry into the MBR, and then I'm going to create a boundary, and from here to here, 32 gigs, is going to be the partition structure. But that starts at its physical location. When you are thinking about partitions, they are in that order on the disk. So you make partition one, and that is your partition, and you make partition two. Partition two, by definition, is... What are, what are you thinking? Partition two, in relation to partition one, what's your impact? It's further in, so it is... Slower. Slower. No matter what you do, Partition 2 is slower than Partition 1. You guys get my point? My, maybe not by much, but by a little bit, it is. So here's the impact. If let's say, let's say this is a server. Let's say I am a managed IT guy and I'm installing small business server. Right? You run small business server? Yeah? So uh, what comes in small business server? What do you get? Software. Windows Server. Yep. What is it? Yep. Exchange. Right. Exchange. What else? SQL. SQL. Right. So you get two massive database engines. Right. So this is the trick, right? So what happens, and what do most IT guys do? They make the boot partition, the outside partition, and that's partition one. I installed my OS. Then they put the utility directory. They put, I'm making a network, so I know I have these DVDs, and I'm going to need to install these on all these users, so I'm going to make this little second partition that puts all my DVDs in it. Then I've got a third partition that I put my users in, because they're always thinking about operating system, network, drivers, printers, users. Then the last choice they make is mail or SQL, right? So that means the last partition is where they're putting the thing that's going to write the most. And I became a star by walking into offices and saying, you know what, I can make your server run 20% faster. And they're like, I don't believe you. I said, I'll put money on it. I'll do it for free. I'll work for free for the weekend. If I prove to you a week later, you pay me for all my time. I became a star. I'm not kidding you. I had 300 corporate clients that told everybody else I didn't spend a dime more and their server was faster than it ever has been before. All you do is back up the partitions and rotate them. That's all you've got to do. Your drive can boot from anywhere. You can boot from your inside. You don't have to boot from the outside. So you can move your OS to the inside where the OS is on the server and it's just taking its time. You put your Exchange server and your SQL server on your outside edge of your platter. Now, somebody's going to tell me in a second, but that's a RAID array. That's not a single hard drive. That's a RAID array. Yep. What do you use to... Put? Multiply this by four. Put four drives in a row. Where's your partitions? Is it different? All you're doing is slicing them across the same drives. So RAID arrays slice them and put them in the same location, in the same physical spots for partitions. So when you make a partition, you might have four of them, it's just bigger. And you're still making partition, partition, partition. You're still doing the same thing. The only difference is you've got a controller that can cache. So it can actually handle multiple drives at the same time. It is a little bit faster. Is 20% 20% no matter what you give it? It is. It's always faster. It's always faster to do it that way. That's what database guys who are called database optimization guys, that's what their job is. The guys at Google who do database optimization, their job is to look at the hardware and figure out where their software will run faster on that hardware and make that work and then figure out all the optimizations they can do in software. But that's part of the job. That's what you're doing. So I'm telling you, it's faster on an outside disk. So you need to start thinking about your disk based on its location and where the content is. Now that's where the next one that somebody says, what if it was solid state? Okay, how many people have a solid state RAID array? Anybody have one? You guys have one? Yeah? You, you ever dealt with one? Nope. So I'm going to tell you this right now. If you are thinking of making your client faster by putting a solid state RAID array in, it is the worst decision you will ever make, right? Because you guys use it for temporary storage, right? 
So you're doing caching and you're doing stuff because you're indexing stuff, but you don't permanently store your data there, right? Because somebody told you there's a bad idea. Because what happens to a RAID array that's solid state? How long is a cell going to last if it's a triple bit? Let's say you have a hard drive that's 512 gigs and you got triple bit. How many, how many times did I tell you you could write to a cell before it would die? That was SLC. Not if it's SLC, which is the oldest one, which is the best one, it actually is that. But as you got bigger and bigger drives, they couldn't do SLC, so they're now typically, because that would be a big drive, it'd be like this. Like for them to stay the same size, they'd store triple the amount in the same cells. So you can only write to it 3,000 times before that cell dies. So, and most of these IT guys don't know this when they're buying the equipment anyway. They don't know, should I buy SLC? Nope, that's way more expensive. It's actually like, like it's more than twice as expensive in most cases. The MLC is a lot cheaper, but 40% slower, but has cash. And then triple bit is stores more data, but it is slower than that. And, but you still only get 10,000 writes at an MLC. So if you take, let's say you have MLCs, let's say you happen to buy a bunch of EVOs and you put five of them in your server, okay? They are all writing at the same time, all the time. They are always writing. So when you hit 10,000 on this drive, how many writes are you on the second drive? You're in the same area. You're right behind it. So a drive dies, you replace the drive. All the other drives are at 10,000 also. One of those only has to die in the process of rebuilding this drive during the same time frame. Even if you're fast, you don't always get all the drives before they've all died in the row. The thing about spinning this is it's a random death. It doesn't happen at a specific time period. Sure, they're not supposed to last past five years, but they don't die at a specific day, a specific time, specific number of writes. It's going to deteriorate over time. So they're playing a game. They're hoping for the best. When you do RAID 5, a drive dies. You can replace a drive, hope it rebuilds before any other drive dies. Right? But that's not the way solid state works. The other thing about solid state is some bugs kick off at a certain time period. So you fill a table and the table gets full. It kicks a bug off and then that drive dies. Well, it's going to kick it off on all of them at the same time. They're all going to be, the, whatever bug it is, whatever happens, your RAID arrays hit it at the same time. And the other thing about servers is people put servers in, they expect those to last. Usually, now, I mean, it was a minimum of four years, but most investments now, they're up to seven years. A lot of these people are running servers for seven to ten years before they'll change them. How long are your solid state drives going to run if they're running full time? What's their death rate? What do you think you're going to get? Two. You're going to be, yeah, you're going to be at maximum two. So right after they feel like they just spent the money and they put it in, they're going to die. Because a CPA doesn't remember that two years ago wasn't yesterday. I promise. They think it's yesterday. You are aware that all ID guys basically wait and put it away on some I didn't have all ID guys basically. So your OS writes left often than, your, than the rest of the drives from that standpoint, but you're still going to use it up. I mean, if you're just trying to boot a server faster, think about it. Once the server's running, who notices? No, no I, I put it always on there, and I put, for instance, the product exchange, the, the financial stuff on there, and that's all. And then they're raised. I think all IT guys does that on different drives. But still, it's a, it's a major concern that they're going to crash, like they say. We don't call it even crash, but they call it not. <laughs> well... Anything that you put on them, and when it dies, it's going down. And that always impacts somebody, right? So if you've got a RAID 5, you want your server to keep running. But if you put it on something else and it dies, it takes it down. How is that beneficial? So, and the other thing is, if you're doing solid state, if you're carrying around this laptop, you better be backing it up all the time. So I, I personally typically use Dropbox. And I put a Dropbox directory in the center of my, my documents folder and nothing important goes on this laptop that's not in that directory. If it's not important, I don't care. And I know, but I'm making that judgment call. But I'm not going to lose anything. The important stuff, my class material all sits in a Dropbox directory. If this dies, I'm popping over to another box. I can get it to it instantly or I can get to it from the web. But, and, and, but I have triple redundancy in other locations and I have other stuff that's everywhere. But I'm just telling you, living on solid state, 
is a bad idea without constant backup, it will die one day and it will be the day after you just did the most work on it that you think you have the most important file. It's always at the worst time too. It's always the day you needed that piece of item, that whatever it is, okay? All right, I know she's here with the food, but uh, it, um, I'm, I'm gonna show you real quick just so everybody can remember where we're at here. It's not completely done with the 75%. It's still running through, but it's enough. I'm just gonna stop it just to make the point. And then I'm gonna turn this machine off. I'm gonna come back over. I'm gonna plug this hard drive in. Now, I have not set my HPA. I didn't do everything else. I just wanna show you. Even though this thing, it's still, uh, it's still there. I still have the same exact setup I had before. I'm going into our studio and I'm gonna find my drive in my partition. That's defined, so I know it's 100 gigs. Now I've got about 72 gigs or so of that 100 gigs. I'm gonna right click, I'm gonna open drive files. Now this is processing the MFT I already copied, right? So once I see my tree, Dun, dun, dun. Come on, come on, come on. Once I see my tree and I go to my directory, as long as these things were copied off uh, that I got that image in that part, I'm just going to take this. I'm going to recover my marked files. I'm going to, now I normally name things by number. So I would normally be at like 72,000, blah, blah, blah. I'm just going to put a number in there though. And that will be the client's number. It's labeled on the drive, labeled on their paperwork. If I have a company who sends me multiple drives, I still number them, but then I would still make it like uh, like Sony and then you know Bob and accounting or whatever it is. So I have them named that way, but they all have their own individual number. So three people at Sony might not have the same the same recovery, so I'm identifying them by number and then usually department or something else. But a lot of places are only gonna be number in a dude or number in a company. Does that make sense? So I'm, and I put it in a directory like I keep all my clients together in a short name. I call it RV because it's recovery because you hit a path limit. Um, there is a spot where you can only have folders that have 255 characters, 255 names. Eventually it'll say your path is too long. So if I know I'm gonna hit that or I do have that problem, I can do either UNC encoding, so I use slash slash server name slash folder, that gets rid of the problem. Or I can put it, uh, it, I can just drop all this and put it in a temporary directory that's short, one character, two character, and then move everything over as soon as it's done. Does that make sense? So a place to put it. So I'm gonna say okay, create it, and now it's dropping those pictures that came from that destination drive into that folder. So while that's happening, and I did Bob today. So, and then I'm gonna switch to images. And so now, I can actually image, recover, copy. And that's what you guys are gonna do also at this point. Like over the next two days, this is gonna be the big piece now is to move your data, bring it back to the laptop and then recover it from that standpoint. Okay, everybody good? So I just wanted to complete that and show you that with the deep spar, I can be surgical. I can try to get a specific folder, directory, item, and then come back and then recover that one and dump that to network, server, local, whatever you want to do, and then give this to the client. Now from here, I normally would say, um, if I've extracted pictures, like I normally will switch to JPEGs to prove to a client that I've recovered things. Even if they wanted documents or something else, I mean, I may get a sample or show them a sample or something. I don't give them the whole recovery because they will not pay you. Um, so I would make a contact sheet out of these. I would use a tool. We used to have, Picasso was free. Picasa was Google's tool that they bought a company and they made that tool free. And what it did was you could just select your directory with all your pictures and it would make like sheets, like a PDF that had eight pictures in it just like this. But I mean, so you could, I mean, you can even do snap if you need to, just take a snap, but you could print them all to a contact sheet. And then I send a PDF that has, you know, 
32 pitchers in a contact sheet. If you show a client pitchers, they'll pay you. It's very visual. They don't have to be digging into Word documents and things like that. If you're successful, they'll take whatever they can get. Okay? Everybody with me so far? All right, so let's eat and then come back, and then we will keep going through the rest.